The evolutionary history of our own species is one of the most fascinating and mysterious areas of study in the science of paleontology. For more than a century, the origin of humans and how we fit into the great evolutionary tree of life has been an intensely debated subject, with astonishing discoveries of extinct human species continuously adding to the ever-growing and complex story of how we got to be where we are today. One of the most significant places for new discoveries regarding human evolution is South Africa. This country, home to the world-famous Cradle of Humankind, has contributed some astounding fossil finds of ancient hominids, including the first ever Australopithecus, the remarkable small-bodied Homo naledi, and the robust-skulled Paranthropus. Well, during our journey to South Africa, where we had been invited to join a paleontological expedition deep into the Karoo Desert by researchers at the University of the Witwatersrand, Doug and I were lucky enough to come face to face with some of these ancient relatives of ours. It was mid-August of 2021 when we found ourselves on a plane heading south, bound for Johannesburg. After an overnight flight that neither of us got any sleep on, we were picked up at the airport by Dr. Julian Benoit, a paleontologist of the Evolutionary Studies Institute at the University of Witwatersrand, who had been the one to invite us on the expedition. Julian took us straight to the university, where he began to enthusiastically show us around the absolutely incredible collections. These uh, bones from the Cradle of Humankind were interpreted as, as uh, weapons. Oh, right. So if you've seen uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, <laughs> you see those uh, Australopithecines smashing stuff, smashing each other. With... Yeah. That's directly inspired from this. Wow, that's so cool. But this was interpreted before we knew taphonomy, so this was... This was interpreted, you know, as a, as a point. This was interpreted, you saw, as a weapon. So. And now we know that most of these are bone damage made, made by hyenas. Of course, it's not only hominid-related finds that are made in South Africa. The Karoo supergroup stretches across much of the country and records a period of time from the late Carboniferous all the way to the Jurassic, covering more than 120 million years of Earth's history. The fossils from here are far, far older than the hominid bones, but no less incredible, and the Evolutionary Studies Institute has an unbelievable collection of the animals from this time, including some stunning skulls of the fearsome Gorgonopsians. Big carnivores of the late Permian. Yeah. Um, so, not only big ones, the big ones are called the Rubigin, so after, uh, not after Bruce Rubidge, but after his grandfather, Sidney yeah. Rubidge. Uh, and the small ones belong to different families. We don't really know how many families there are. The, the Gorgonopsians are surprising for... They have the lowest ratio of um, people who study them over amazing... <laughs> amazingness. Yeah. <laughs> like there's very few people working on Gorgonopsians. Yeah. So, and I don't know why, because you see the, these guys are... Yeah, they're they look incredible. Cool. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, everyone loves they are big carnivores with uh, saber-like canines. Getting to hold these perfectly preserved skulls was such an awesome experience, and Julian continued to show us the spectacular fossils they have here, including the Jurassic dinosaur Massospondylus, the bizarre Proterosuchus, a reptile with a distinct downturned snout tip, the massive skull of the top predator Erythrosuchus, the biggest carnivore on Earth at the time it lived, and the strange-looking skulls of an animal called Lystrosaurus, a creature we would become very familiar with, as you'll see in the next few episodes. Dr. Benoit also showed us some amazing specimens of animals known as cynodonts, a very important group with regards to the origins of mammals. We have the first thing I like to show with those cynodonts is that when you know paleontology, you know that cynodonts are the things that gave birth to mammals, mm. and you always, always ima imagine them small, but that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> some of them, as you can see, diademodon here are very big. Yeah. So uh, Diademodon was an herbivorous cynodon, so you can see big attachment sites for masticatory yeah, muscles, wow. uh, forward-facing eyes, <laughs> yeah. interestingly, and yet when you flip them over, so you see more muscle attachment here for the masseter muscles, here wow. and here, and the secondary palate that we mammals inherited, and the broad so you can't see the teeth, but the sockets you can see are, yeah. are broad. And the secondary palate 
enables chewing and breathing at the same time. Yeah. So that's also an adaptation for that. And these guys are descend all descended from something that looked like this. It's Cynognathus, which is the only Cynognathian that has sectorial teeth, so <laughs> meat chewing, meat chewing teeth. We were also lucky enough to see and get to hold some truly stunning fossils of the Cynodont thrinaxodon, the burrowing creature that our field expedition got its name from, Thrinax 2021. Ben's child. <laughs> it feels like it. <laughs> some of the fossils in the collection even still had their bite. I just want you to touch that cutting edge and feel <laughs> that it's still <laughs> sharp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> still sharp and you can still see the all those tiny serrations that you want. That wow. thing is three times as old as a T-Rex, huh? Yeah. <laughs> no, maybe more. T-Rex is 70, 70. It's almost four times as old wow. as a T-Rex. <laughs> and, uh, and you see that the, the, the cutting edge is yeah. still as sharp as, <laughs> as it used to be. And what's interesting on that one is look at those ornaments on the side of the snout. That thing has a crocodilian. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why that's why I get mad when people put whiskers. Yeah. <laughs> like that thing alone demonstrates that there was that thing had a crocodilian face. So is that the kind of thing where because crocodilians have sort of like cracked skin over the Yeah snout, exactly like, so like this was a scaly pad. face. Yeah. And it's on both sides. So Yeah wow. We also got to see the scarily huge skull of Antiosaurus, a giant predator of the Permian. So Antiosaurus, that's... And that's not even an adult. <laughs> that's a, that's, crazy. that's a, a, a teenager. Wow. The, the adult ones are that long. And uh, you can see on the horns, actually. The horns are yeah. extremely big on <laughs> the adults. And that ridge here is extremely high. Adults are super ugly. That one is nice and streamlined. <laughs> After leaving the collections, we were then taken to the prep lab to see the incredible achievements of the preparators working tirelessly to expose these important specimens from the rocks they are encased in. It was here that Julian showed us an extraordinary specimen of an indeterminate Gorgonopsian snout with a very interesting feature preserved on it, a tooth embedded in the side of the skull. This tooth, the cross section of which is visible here, has a bony callus surrounding it, indicating this Gorgonopsian survived the bite and healed. Julian had just published a paper about this specimen in which he and colleagues proposed that, if this wasn't the result of failed predation, then it could be evidence of social face-biting between Gorgonopsians, the first evidence of such behaviour to be found in these organisms. But it was after this that Doug and I were then allowed into one of the ESI's most treasured collections, the Hominid Vault. This might be the largest collection of fossil hominids held in one place anywhere on Earth, with more than 3,500 fossils kept here. Some of the most significant hominid discoveries made in the history of human evolution are housed in this vault, and stepping into this immense assemblage of astonishing specimens was an indescribable experience. Out of all of the spectacular fossils in this room, one of the first that captured our attention was the stunning skull of the famous Town Child, the real thing right there on display. It's the Town Child. What I like to show is the, the teeth, like you look at those teeth, they look like fresh. Yeah. It's like that thing died yesterday. And here on the brain, well, on the endocast, you can see the, the veins. <laughs> it's incredible. This skull was the first ever Australopithecus to be found, coming from a limestone quarry in the small town of Taung in 1924. A year later, a professor of anatomy at Vitz Uni, Raymond Dart, named and described the skull in the journal Nature, calling it Australopithecus africanus, and recognising it as a highly important piece in the puzzle of human evolution. Dart received a lot of criticism from other hominid workers of the time, who mostly favoured Asia as the place of origin for our lineage and not Africa as this fossil would seem to suggest with people pointing out that since the town skull comes from a child, this might explain the human-like features, as younger non-human apes tend to look more human than adult ones do. They instead considered it to represent a strange ape species that lived long after the branch leading to our species had diverged, but didn't think it could be related to our ancestors. Despite all this doubt, later discoveries of more Australopithecines provided support for Dart's original idea, as Julian explained as he showed us casts of the specimens. So that's a juvenile. Uh, so 
people were not immediately convinced that it was an ancestor, a nominee ancestor because in juvenile you expect the snout to be quite short, which is a nominee feature, but it's also a juvenile mm. feature, a short snout. So the, that was a, a, a baby. So not everybody was convinced that it was a nominee ancestor, but just a juvenile feature, that short snout. But then, so, some years later, Robert Broom <laughs> found that skull, which is the most famous uh, Australopithecus Africanus skull known. It's Mrs. Pless. <laughs> Mrs. Pless is also the most complete skull of an Australopithecus Africanus to ever be found in the country, and was originally named by Robert Broom as Plesianthropus transvalensis, hence the nickname, but was then later synonymized with Australopithecus. Uh, and it's called Mrs. because uh, of the canine socket here which are very small, so hypothetically belonging to a female. Mm. Uh, and Mrs. Pless, you can see, has a nice protruding snout, but not too big, at least not, uh, not as big as that of a gorilla, for example. Yeah. So definitely a nominid. And the foramen magnum is in ventral position and not at the back mm. of the skull, as in a gorilla, for example. So, so Mrs. Pless was the first, uh, that, that's really the specimen that anchored the origin of hominid in Africa. Uh, uh, the problem, as British people, you know the, the, the what it's called, the Piltdown Man, man yeah. controversy. Uh, at, the time the, at the time they found Mrs. Pless, Piltdown Man was already quite, uh, mm. I mean, people many people considered the Pildown Man quite doubtful because it did not fit what we knew about hominid evolution at that time. Um, clearly, a specimen like Mrs. Pless was telling uh, the jaw were becoming humans before the brain. The jaws are reduced so, and the brain is still small while the, the Pildown Man was the exact opposite. <laughs> the brain was big and the jaws were big too. So the, the Pildon man was giving a story where humans get their big brain first and then lose their monkey jaws. And Mrs. Pless and Homo erectus and Neanderthalensis were telling a, a different story where the jaws became human first and then the brain grew. So some people already questioned the Pildon man and then in 1954, if I remember correctly, uh, Le Gros Clark published the first carbon dating ever, <laughs> yeah. which was also the carbon <laughs> dating of the Pildon Man that proved it was not uh, as old enough to be an actual uh, mm. hominid. So yeah, so, and this, this is how basically the, the story of human in Africa started <laughs> <laughs> with that guy, uh, that baby, and then that guy. Not only was the Tong child instrumental in clarifying where our species had originated, but the story of what happened to this individual itself is fascinating and quite tragic too. Yeah, and using CT scanning, they, they saw, because the, the, the orbits were not prepared. So if you look, it's, they are still not prepared. But uh, they used CT scanning then to look at the bottom of the orbits mm. and they could see traces of the talon of a... Uh, how do you call that? A bird of prey. The researchers compared the traces in the orbit of the town child to marks found on the skulls of modern primates that are killed by eagles, discovering that they were remarkably consistent. It's possible then that the town child was killed on the nearby plains before being picked up by a large raptor and carried into the bird's nest. There, after it had been fed on, the skull might have fallen from the nest and rolled into a cave, becoming preserved for millions of years. So the, that, that poor guy <laughs> was... <laughs> catch like this and carried to the cave by uh, by a bird of prey so that's the whole story of that poor <laughs> that poor little guy another of the particularly fascinating specimens on display in this room is the australopithecus skeleton named littlefoot so you can see the foot doesn't have the same color as the rest of the skeleton it's because it was found a lot earlier than the rest of the skeleton and it was prepared in the old ways, <laughs> so uh, a bit more destructive. You can see that there's a bit more of the bone that was <laughs> yeah. shipped away. So Ron Clark discovered the foot here in a box in 1993, a box that was labeled Bovid, Bovid box. <laughs> um, and so tracing the history of that box, he found out that 
Robert Broom had blasted that the that those bovid bones <laughs> uh, like in the 1940s or something like that out of stack fontaine once again <laughs> <laughs> so and so ron clark start looking for more bones uh, more hominid bones that were lost in bovid <laughs> bo- <laughs> bovine boxes and he eventually find that other tiny tiny bit that you can see on the other side here so that tiny bit of foot bone here is the same but on the right side as a, a bone that you can see here on the left side and it says and it comes from the same place well the the box it's written yeah. on the box that it comes from the same uh, the same part of the cave he knows it's coming from the same place it, he knows it's the right part of the nominee and he already has the left part the only reason why you would have the left and the right part mm. is because you have a pelvis connecting them at some point. It was 1997 when Clark found the fragment of bone from the right foot, and soon after he sent a couple of his assistants into Sturkfontein Cave in the Cradle of Humankind to try and locate the rest of the skeleton. After just two days of searching, they came across more leg bones, and realised that there was probably a complete skeleton present in the limestone here. So they continued to excavate the bones, managing to find the beautifully preserved skull in 1998. It turned out that this was the most complete skeleton of an early human lion hominin to ever be discovered, with the vast majority of the bones being present. The vault also contains a real specimen of Australopithecus sediba, the species named by paleoanthropologist Lee Berger and colleagues in 2010. So the adult is the actual one. Uh, here you have, uh, that's a reconstruction of Homo of uh, Australopithecus sediba, uh, which is the juvenile one because it's there's the skull. A cast of the juvenile holotype specimen is also displayed in one of the cases. When A. sediba was first named back in 2010, it was interpreted by researchers as a potential direct ancestor of the Homo genus, since it displays many similar features and at the time of discovery was thought to predate the earliest examples of Homo erectus. However, this sparked quite a bit of controversy among hominid researchers, and it now seems that Australopithecus sediba actually coexisted with Homo erectus, as well as Paranthropus, with all these hominids being found from around the same time in the Cradle of Humankind. Julian also gave us a lesson in a very useful, quick way to distinguish between hominin skulls. So in uh, Edelbergensis, when you look at the eyes, it's hungry. <laughs> <laughs> When you look at Homo sapiens, you look at the eyes, it's sad. <laughs> and Neanderthal, it's just neutral. It's very <laughs> surprised. <laughs> Maybe a bit surprising. Oh my god, someone's got my head. <laughs> so that's how you make the difference. When you have a, a nominee with a big brain, so you can't really know if it's erectus or whatever, you just look at the eyes. That was a good trick. Yeah. <laughs> Another remarkable specimen in this collection includes a first-generation cast of the famous Lucy fossil, the Australopithecus afarensis discovered in Ethiopia in the 1970s. Before we left, we also got to see a couple of casts from the relatively recently named human species Homo naledi. Discovered in a system of caves in the cradle called Rising Star Cave, this species was only described in 2015, astonishing the world with the realisation that small-bodied and small-brained humans existed up until very recently. Seeing these specimens, as well as everything else we'd seen in the hominid vault, was making us incredibly excited for the experiences we were about to have exploring this country, especially considering that the very next day we would be venturing down into the cave system where Homo naledi actually came from. But before we went there, we were in for one more treat that day. Not only did we get to see the CT scanner used by researchers to look inside fossil specimens, but in the same room, just sitting on the desk, was one of the most extraordinary fossils that has ever been found. Right here was the actual odd couple specimen. Although it's still encased in rock, there was also a 3D printed representation of what was discovered to be inside this fossil when it was scanned at the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility. A Thrinaxodon individual cuddled up next to a kind of amphibian called Brumistega. I've talked a lot more about the specimen before in my video on Thrinaxodon, but it seems these two unrelated animals were entombed together in the end of a burrow made by the Thrinaxodon due to a flood, and it really must be one of the most fantastic discoveries ever made in paleontology. I still can't quite believe that I actually got to hold the fossil itself, it really was an amazing experience. 
And with that, our first day in South Africa was over. And what a great start to our time in this country. We'd already seen so much, and despite the intense fatigue from a sleepless overnight flight, it felt so exciting to be here. Looking around, the awe-inspiring collections of the ESI had made us so eager to get out into the field and make some discoveries for ourselves, and we felt a monumental sense of privilege that we'd been able to come face to face with these ancient hominid fossils. Staring at the skulls of some of our earliest human relatives evokes considerable feelings of connection to the natural world around us and our place in the evolutionary history of life on this planet. It truly is an unparalleled experience, and I still can't believe how lucky we were. But that isn't it for our hominid adventures. In the next episode, join us as we descend into the ancient cave systems of the cradle of humankind, exploring the very places where numerous Australopithecines and Homo naledi individuals have been found. Discover how these caves are explored and excavated, as well as how Homo naledi completely rewrote what we thought we knew of human evolution. Thank you so much for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new, and I really hope you're enjoying our South African adventures so far. A huge thank you once again to everyone who donated and made this trip possible, allowing Doug and I, as well as students at Vitz University, to get this experience doing paleontological fieldwork. 